Welcome, everybody. What a blessing it is to be together and to be able to worship and to sing and to just be in the presence of our Father. Let us bow our heads as, as, we, as we begin in, in the service and we invite the Holy Spirit to be with us. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we are thankful for your love, for your blessing, Lord, and uh, just for your forgiveness, God. We know it's been um, some challenging couple of days, Lord, but we know when we trust and we remain Lord, faithful in, in, in your faithfulness, God. So please send this Holy Spirit down to us, Lord. May it uh, comfort us. May it heal us, Lord. May it strengthen us, Lord. May it fill us with, with your love and, and with the joy that only you can bring. We thank you, Lord, for everything you've done, for what you will do, Lord, and for what's to come. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, kids, join us at this time. We are going to be... Uh, singing about the goodness of God. So if you have any instruments, um, go ahead and, and grab them. And if you don't, just uh, grab something that you can make sound with and um, join us as we sing, uh, You Are Good. Amen, amen, amen. 
The goodness of the God never stops, family. Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting inside us. We cannot contain. Your love will surely come find us like blazing wildfires singing your name. God of mercy, sweet love of mine, I have surrendered to your desire may the suffering stretch across the skies these hallelujahs be multiplied you love is like radiant diamonds Bursting inside of us, we cannot contain. Your love will surely come find us like blazing wildfire, singing your name. God of mercy, God of mercy. inside us we cannot contain your love will surely come find us like blazing wildfires singing your During these times, we all know we can always rely on God. We know that God is our foundation. God is our rock. God is our cornerstone. And I invite you, family, to turn right now to your Bibles. Turn to Psalm 118. It's a beautiful psalm. It's a beautiful psalm of redemption. It's a beautiful psalm of of God's faithfulness and power. And we're going to read from verse 24 and on. So I apologize. Verse 21 and on. And it's going to read like this. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. 
The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest flame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ Sabbath church family um, we want to share with you a Bible verse that has brought us comfort through these difficult times and it is found in Isaiah 43 1 through 4 I've redeemed you I've called your name you're mine when you're in over your head I'll be there with you when you're in rough waters you will not go down when you're between a rock and a hard place it won't be a dead end because I am God your personal God the Holy of Israel, your Savior. I paid a huge price for you. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. 
And this is a beautiful um, reminder of how much God loves us. And it is our prayer that His love, His mercy, and His peace will be the anchor that holds us through the rest of our lives. So that when we do face trials and tribulations, we know that God is on our side. Feliz sábado, familia. Los extrañamos mucho y los queremos mucho. Pasa un buen día. We love you and we miss you. Okay, family, it's time for the word. Let's have a word of prayer as we get ready to get into scripture this morning. Dear God, once again, thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for this moment that we have together. We pray that you may speak loud and clear, Lord, and that we may, we may find in you someone that we can trust. We may remember, Lord, that, that you are there for us, that you, when options run out, that it is you that we can turn to. Give us the faith, give us the strength, Lord. Give us the ability to trust. In Jesus' name, amen. Yo, family, so as many of you guys know, I have, I have three little ones. I have three children, a 10-year-old, 7-year-old, and then I got Josiah, who is two. Josiah is an amazing, amazing little boy. He is becoming so independent and so just uh, resourceful. This man, just if he has an issue, if he has a problem, this guy is a problem solver by nature, right? So a couple weeks ago, this dude started waking himself up in the morning, you know, crawling out of his crib. The very first thing he does is he reaches for a diaper. Who reaches for a diaper? He reaches for a diaper. He gets a pair of shoes, usually his Jordans. He loves his Jordans. And he walks over to our bed and wakes us up, hands us a diaper, hands us a Jordans, and says, essentially, go ahead and wipe me, put on my shoes because I'm ready to go on for the day. And I love the fact that he is so, almost so self-sufficient, right? He is so resourceful. If he ever wants something, dude climbs on anything to grab it, or he will figure anything out, right? He has figured out screens, controls, absolutely everything. But there's one thing that he cannot figure out yet. There's one thing that he just is not able to do on his own, and that's put on his shoes. For some reason, he cannot put on his shoes. He, he's even attempted to put on his diaper before. I mean, you name it, he's tried it. But putting on his shoes has just been hard for him. It's just something that's outside of his ability. No matter how much of a problem solver he is, he just cannot put on his shoes. Family, I, I don't know if this resonates with you, but I tend to be a problem solver myself. Whenever there's an issue, I can pretty much come up with a list of things that I can do to fix that issue. I can pretty much uh, tell you where to look online or where to find a tutorial. I mean, we can figure out how to solve some problems. But there are some problems in life that there's just simply no easy solution to. No matter how much ability you may have, no matter how much uh, talent or how resourceful you may be, we all got that pair of shoes, right? We all got that issue that we cannot do for ourselves. We all have some things that are outside of our control, that no matter how much we know or how able we're able, how, how capable we are able to be, right? How capable we are, it's just simply out of our reach. And we cannot fix or we cannot solve certain issues. Family, it seems like we are in a season in life where things have spun out of control. And there's some stuff that no matter how much ability we have, how much talent, how much charm we may have, the truth is all of that stuff falls short because the thing that we're in or the season that we're in, the unemployment or the, the sickness or the depression or the anxiety or the fear, it's just simply overpowering. It's, it's spun out of control. I want us to go to a book of the Bible, the book of Isaiah, to look at the, a brief story of a king by the name of Hezekiah. Follow me to Isaiah uh, chapter 38, verses one through three, as we're gonna look at this, 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 this brief account of of a very crucial moment in Hezekiah's life. Isaiah 38 verse one gives us a glimpse into the moment when Hezekiah, the king, a good king in Israel, by the way, I mean, this, this king got rid of idols. He got, he got rid of altars. He was a good king in the eyes of God. He had been sick and he, he was on his deathbed. And now he calls a prophet by the name of Isaiah to come in to speak over him. Scripture gives us a glimpse of what that conversation looked like, what it, what it looked like to have been in that room where Hezekiah was, where Isaiah came in and they had this amazing exchange having to do with Hezekiah's own health. 
By this point, Hezekiah had lost control of his health. It seemed like he had just spiraled out of control and he found himself in a deathbed and enters in, in enters Isaiah, right? To have this conversation with him, to let him know what God thought about his disease. Isaiah 38 verses 1 and on begin reading this way. And in those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus saith the Lord, set your house in order or you will die. You're not going to recover out of this. Yo, so watch this. Hezekiah looks at his health and he realizes this thing is spiraling out of control. He reaches out to the prophet. The prophet comes in and essentially tells Hezekiah, um, you're, you're dying. Like there's no coming out of this thing. There is, there is no positive prognosis. Your life has spiraled out of control. Have you ever gone through a season where your life just simply spirals out of control and, and you've, lost, you've lost all sense of direction, you've lost all sense of confidence. It just seems like nothing you do or nothing you used to do could ever bring you back to this place where you used to be, this place of wholeness. That's, that's Hezekiah. And maybe, maybe, maybe that's a season you are in right now, right? With unemployment or with sickness or maybe you're just... You've lost control because you've been grieving these crazy transitions we've been going through, through as, as a society. Maybe you've lost control as well. So Hezekiah's in his deathbed. He calls over Isaiah. Isaiah comes on in. And the big reveal, the big moment where Isaiah discloses the truth to this king essentially goes like this. Hezekiah, I'm sorry to break it to you, but you're going to die. You're going to die, and now what God is telling you to do is to put your house in order, go ahead and write your will, make sure that everything you own is well distributed among those people close to you, because essentially, you're in the final chapters of your life. So Isaiah comes in and tells Hezekiah, you're going to die. So imagine, if Hezekiah felt like things were out of control, now they were really out of control, right? Because he was about to lose his very but there's something in this story that, that just caught my attention. Notice how Hezekiah was dying, but he was not yet dead. He, he, was, he was about to be done, but he was not quite done, right? So, so it seems as though when, 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 when the prophet Isaiah tells him, hey, put your house in order, it seems as though Hezekiah still had a little bit of time to do just a little bit more praying. He had a little bit more time. He had, he, he, he was, even though he was dying, he wasn't quite dead yet. Even though he was about to be done, he wasn't done yet. And I, I want to just speak to anyone who may feel like you're done, who may feel like you're, you're, you're at the final stage of, 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 of maybe that relationship or that, or that space where you found yourself emotionally during this season. You may be at the end of your rope, but let me tell you something. You're still on the rope. You may feel like you're dying, but you're not dead yet. You may feel like you're about to be done, but you are not done yet. You still have breath in your lungs and a heartbeat in your chest. And if you have breath and if you have a heartbeat, then there's still something you can do about it. So Hezekiah, understanding that he still had a little bit of time, what does he do? Verse 2 tells us that he turns to prayer. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord. Family, I want to talk to us for a brief moment about the resource, about the power of prayer. Prayer is a resource. It is a form of power that is always available and yet seldom used. There's a story of this elderly woman who lived on top of a mountain, top of a hill, and that hill overlooked this, this beautiful, beautiful town in the middle of this mountain range. And everyone, everyone in this town was waiting for electricity to finally come into the town. And it came the day when electricity came into the town and everyone got power except for the woman who lived on top of that hill. After a lot of insisting, 
That woman was finally convinced that electricity was a good thing. She was used to lighting her house with candles at all times. So her house was always shining on top of the mountain, but it was candles lighting up the place. Finally, the day came when electricity was installed in her house, and everyone thought from now on that little house on top of the hill is going to be like this, like this, like this beaming light, right? Just, just shining over the city because finally this woman would have had electricity. After she got her electricity installed and lights installed all over her house, everyone waited with expectation for that night when finally her house would be illuminated and she wouldn't have to rely on the candles anymore. That night came, everyone waited with expectation, and around sunset, they realized that, boom, the lights turned on all over her house, just lighting it up, beautiful. Everyone rejoiced, except that the lights only lasted for about five minutes. And then they waited for the next day, and sure enough, the lights came on right at sunset, and everyone was like, okay, finally, she is using electricity, except for the fact that the lights only lasted for five minutes. And that happened day after day after day, and finally someone went up there and said, "Uh, excuse me, ma'am, why is it that you only turn on your lights for five minutes? That's when he discovered. The reason she only turned them on for five minutes is because she only turned them on to be able to have enough light to set up her candles. And then she would shut them back off and she would remain with candlelight for the rest of the time. You see, this woman had a power. She now had a resource. She had light that at one point she didn't have. And even though the power was there, she still chose to use other methods. Family, that's that's how it is with prayer. We have the most amazing resource in the universe. We get to speak to the living God And yet, oftentimes, we rely on our own efforts instead. Yo, family, navigating a season like the one we're in without prayer is like trying to mow the lawn with scissors, man. It's impossible. It's impossible to do this. It's it's, it's impossible to accomplish this. Now, I know we got all sorts of listeners as we're watching this message, right? We got people who are like professional PhD level prayers, whatever that means. And then there's you and I who really, when it comes to praying, a lot of times we don't, even, we don't even know what to pray about. We see people who pray beautifully and we're like, man, I wish I could pray like that. But the truth is, my prayers are sloppy and messy and, and clumsy. Family, I know it can be daunting to talk about prayer and to put prayer into practice, but let me remind you that you learn about prayer by praying. You learn how to pray by praying. You learn by doing the thing. So prayer is a moment when you get to finally slow down and and be in the presence of God. It's a moment where you get to stand and breathe and pause and listen and be reminded of the thing that you already know. You already know that God is God. You already know that there's only one throne in the universe and it does not belong to you. You already know who sits on the throne. Family. Prayer is a moment where we are reminded that God is the ultimate reality. He is the ultimate power in the universe. He is a being that is so great and so large and yet so present and so near. So this man, this king, when everything else would have failed, he he turns his back and, and he seeks the Lord in prayer. But watch this. He prays as though he believed prayer made a difference. He prayed as though he believed that God could change the trajectory of his life based on that prayer. Family, I want to encourage us to pray audacious prayers. Pray big prayers. I mean, pray, pray, let's pray in proportion to our understanding of God. If our understanding of God is small, then let's pray small prayers. But I I want to submit to you, I'd like to suggest to you that you know your God is big. You know your God is is, is great and he is powerful. Then let's pray prayers in proportion to that God. Family, we're going to take a moment to to converse with one another. If you're at a watch party today or if you are alone, maybe with a journal today, we have a question for you to wrestle with. We have a question for you that that we would love for you to reflect on, maybe write on, or have a a short conversation with. We're we're gonna put a couple minutes on the screen. Go ahead and take this moment to go through this following question. When you're going through a crisis, what do you turn to first? 
prayer or your own ability? I'm going to ask that again. When you're going through a crisis, what do you turn to first? Is it prayer or is it your own ability and why? Take a couple moments to discuss and we'll come back and continue with the message. As I was reading this thing, I, I just, I was so inspired by, by Hezekiah. Notice now as, as he is praying to God, no, notice his prayer. I, I love how real this guy got. Watch. Verse 3 of that same, uh, let's go to verse, yeah, verse 3 of that same chapter. Notice what it says. And that Hezekiah said, please, Lord, remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and have done what is good in his sight. Like, I, I, I know, you know, we got to be humble before the Lord. And I, I know, you know, even our greatest works are as filthy rags, right? The Bible says. But I just love how real this guy got. He essentially comes before the presence of God and says, Lord, look, I've been trying. I've been doing my best. I know I, I, I'm on my deathbed and I know I have a death sentence, right? I know my prognosis, my prognosis is not looking good, but the truth is I, I, I've done my best. I've been trying to be faithful to you. I've been trying to serve you where everyone else has failed. I have tried to do what is right. I love the fact that this guy is not hesitating to just simply be himself before God. He comes clean. He keeps it real. Lord, come on. I've been trying to do good. I've been trying to be faithful. He opens up his heart. Right? He shows God his resume and says, Lord, come on, just take that into consideration. man. Take that into consideration. Take the fact that I've been trying my best into consideration. And watch how verse 3 all of a sudden ends and says, And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Not only was he real about just simply opening up his heart and saying, Lord, come on, I've been doing my best here. I've been trying my best. Hezekiah actually breaks down in tears. Family, when was the last time you just broke down before God? When was the last time you just broke down and, and showed him the, 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 the pain in your heart and the, the anxiety in your heart and the depression in your heart? When was the last time you showed him the dark places in your heart? See, a lot of times whenever we talk about prayer, we think of the beautiful prayers that we've heard or the beautiful and adorned language that people use around us or in the church. But family, prayer is just opening up our hearts as though to a friend. And this guy just, pff, look, God, I've been doing my best. And then all of a sudden he just breaks down and weeps. I, I believe God honored the fact that Hezekiah kept it real. He kept it real. He was not pretending to be anything. He was not trying to perform and, and, and please God with the right prayer. He kept it real. He, he was raw about his prayer. And family, I, I love what one of my friends says, and, and I'll repeat this uh, here, and I've said it here in church before. God can't help the person you're pretending to be. He can't come and help the person you are pretending to be. God is not going to help the mask you wear before him. God wants you to remove that mask. God wants you to remove the veil that we have placed before God and us. 
God can't help the people that we're pretending to be. And I think Hezekiah got that. He got that. He, he came clean. He said, Lord, I've been trying. I've been doing my best here. And then he just breaks down and weeps. But it's not like a cute weep. He weeps bitterly. There's, there's a groan, right? There's, there's depth to the tears of Hezekiah. Now, before we wrap up this, this Sabbath, I want us to, to look at one detail. This one thing that happens as Hezekiah is in prayer. Verse 2 of that same chapter gives us a detail that we, we cannot miss as we're looking at the short story. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and he prayed to the Lord. He turned his face to the wall. Now, a lot of commentators say that he turned his face because he was too bashful. He didn't want people watching him weep. But, but I want to submit to you that the reason why he turns his face may be a little different. You see, at this point, he had lost control. He had lost control. He was in his deathbed, and he just got the worst possible news. He realized that this, this sickness was going to lead to death. And before him, he had power. He had authority, right? He had popularity. He had, he had people who would adulate and celebrate and admire him. And, and all of a sudden, Hezekiah realizes that all those things, all those abilities, all those talents, all those gifts, all that position, all that platform that he had in that entire kingdom fell short. They were useless because he was hopeless. They were useless in this moment of hopelessness. None of his talent mattered. The power, his authority, his accomplishments, the adulation of the people, none of it could fix the thing that he was facing now. So Hezekiah turns his face from the power, from the authority, from the people who would celebrate him, right? From the people who would recognize his accomplishments. He turns his back on his own strength. He turns his back on his own talents. He turns his back on his own ability and essentially says, only the Lord can fix this predicament I'm in. Family, there's some stuff that you can't resource. There's some stuff that you can't, you can't talent your way out of it. And you can't charm your way out of some stuff. You cannot power your way out of some stuff. You cannot, uh, uh, you know, you cannot leverage your authority over everything. There's some stuff that your authority remains useless before. Your power, your strength, your charm, your career, your bank account, your relationships. There's some stuff that just simply cannot be affected by any of those abilities. And I believe that Hezekiah, Hezekiah, Hezekiah realized that all those things that at one point seemed powerful were useless in the face of this hopelessness. Something amazing happened in the life of Hezekiah at this moment. He went from self-sufficient to God-sufficient. And I believe that's, that's a transition that we need to make when we're in this season of quarantine. God, I believe, is leading us. He wants us to reach the other side of this trial, having moved from self-sufficiency to God-sufficiency. Family, this is a season when you and I also turn to the wall. And we no longer look at our talents and our gifts and our money and our career and our charm and our followers or retweets as the things that can fix our predicaments. But rather, we face, our, we, we face the wall, we turn our eyes towards God as the ultimate power to confront these different things that may torment us. Family, this does not mean that we leave our careers. This does not mean that all of a sudden we break our relationships or we do away with our money. That's not what we're seeing here. What, we, what this means is that we know and we recognize that our money is not going to be the solution to all of our problems. That a lot of the predicaments we find ourselves in cannot be solved by our charm or our talents. So maybe, just maybe, God is leading us to turn our back towards the wall. Turn towards the wall and our back from all these things, all this self-sufficiency that at one point we relied on, that we may fully rely on the Lord instead. I have another question for you before we land this thing. And this is the following question. What things do you turn to that are useless 
when you find yourself hopeless? What things do you turn to that end up being useless when you find yourself in a situation that is hopeless? Take a couple moments and we'll come back as we wrap up this message. So watch what happens. Isaiah breaks the news to Hezekiah. Hezekiah turns towards the wall. He turns his back on all that self-sufficiency, all those abilities that at one point he perhaps relied on. And he comes clean with God. God, I've been trying, man. And he begins to weep. Now the Bible says in verse 4, and I'm landing with this, Then the Lord came to Isaiah and said, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will add 15 years to your life. Family, that's a fascinating, fascinating event. Because Hezekiah believed in prayer enough, and he prayed enough. He prayed as though he believed that God could use that prayer to even change his own diagnosis. And God honors this thing. His diagnosis is reversed and he is finally given the good news that he's gonna get 15 more years of life. 15 more years. 15 more years. Now, I, I, I want you to, re to reflect on this for a moment. From that moment on, Hezekiah, was aware that those 15 years had been given to God by God's own grace. I mean, can you imagine the kind of life that you would be living if God says, okay, I'm going to add 15 more years to your life. Wouldn't that just cause you to live more faithfully and live more gratefully and, and, and live a life of service and, and commitment and faithfulness to God? Family, I want to suggest to you today that many of us are here and we are living our 15 years. I'm not saying that we only have 15 years. I'm saying that the only reason we're standing is because God has answered our prayers. The only reason we have a family, the only reason we have a career, the only reason we have our health is because God has added 15 years for our life. And I'm not talking about a literal 15 years. I'm talking about God simply answering your prayers. And God has extended your life. God has extended your career. God has extended your ministry. God has extended your service. God has answered your prayers. And I want to submit to you that as we reflect that 
whatever we live in, right? The thing that, that, that the season that we are in, the, the health that we enjoy, the, the family, the relationships that we have around us, we ought to be honoring God because that is all in answer to prayer. And family, I wanna just simply extend this invitation. Look at your life. What in your life today is only there thanks to an answer to prayer? What is that thing that you prayed about yesterday that God granted you and that you're living on today. Well, that's the very thing that you ought to use to honor and glorify God with. You prayed for health yesterday, you are enjoying health today, then honor God with your body. Honor God with your health. You prayed for that relationship yesterday and you find yourself in that relationship today, you honor God in that relationship. You pray for that job, you find yourself in that job, honor God through that job. Family, we're all here to thanks mercy and the grace and the faithfulness of God. And it is our invitation today that you may commit once again to serve God, to live for God, and to turn your backs on things that may prove useless when you find yourself hopeless, and that you may turn towards the wall, fully relying and fully trusting on God as the ultimate power in your life. Lord, thank you because you're faithful and because you listen to our prayer, and we can pray to you as though we believe that our prayer can make a difference. May we take some lessons from Hezekiah, and may we apply these to our lives, Lord, today and always. In Jesus' name.